Hey, what's going on everybody? Justin here, and after finishing my last book, which was on the history of sharks, I decided why not to do a whole video on like marine biology. I think I used to do kind of videos on different topics on like nature or history and kind of books related to those topics. So if you have any ideas for different things that, you know, that I kind of like read about, um, whether it's, you know, like trees or insects, whatever, uh, let me know down in the comments below and I'll see if I can put a video together uh, based on like some of the books I've read. But in this video, we're gonna be doing marine marine biology so I got five books and why don't we just go ahead and get into it so we're gonna start with the shark book that I just finished um, and if you want to see a full review I'll leave it up in the corner and down below as well but we got the secret history of sharks the rise of the ocean's most fearsome predators by John Long and I was sent this by Valentine Books, so thank you to them for that but this was this is definitely one of my favorite secret histories or hidden life of you know insert plant or animal here um, just super well done and it's just full chocks full of different illustrations and photographs and diagrams and maps and all kinds of different things kind of related to you know the archaeology and the evolutionary history of sharks uh, and that's kind of the strong emphasis of this book is it traces the entire evolutionary lineage of sharks from when they separated from kind of armored plated fishes way back in the day and just kind of how they've sort of adapted and survived to all kinds of different changing conditions on planet Earth, all the different mass extinction events that they've kind of gone through, uh, different kind of strategies they probably utilize to kind of survive and pull through those uh, different events. But it's just super full of kind of like random little vignettes, uh, little like kind of tidbits on different things about like their senses when they first evolve, things like that. But also, uh, just for example, uh, Viva Parody, uh, which is giving birth to live young, probably originated, they pushed it back, like a shark scientist pushed it so far back. Um, it actually was even, maybe even before sharks with some of those uh, kind of armored plated fishes that I was uh, just talking about. That's how far back <laughs> bearing live uh, 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 children, <laughs> children is that the, uh, live young uh, goes back, which is kind of crazy. And I wouldn't have, you know, just never even like thought to like look for that or learn that from anything else. So just, just like I said, just full of random tidbits and stuff. We also learn tons about sharks all the way up through the present day and all the challenges and plights that they're encountering. So if you enjoy Shark Week, if you enjoy sharks, definitely check out this title. Next up, we got The Sound of the Sea, Seashells and the Fate of the Oceans by Cynthia Barnett. I'm not sure what I, where I took this, maybe camping or something. As you can see, it's got like smoke or some kind of dirt or something all over it. But uh, it wasn't coming off when I tried to prep it before the video and everything. Uh, but anyways, this is all about kind of like just ocean science uh, with a big slant kind of through the lens of different organisms that build seashells. Um, and you kind of learn about all the different kind of chemistry that's involved uh, with different mollusks, uh, different snails, everything like that, that build shells, how it's becoming more difficult for them, not only just to kind of create them in the first place, uh, due to the kind of the acidification of the ocean waters and whatnot, but also uh, when they're damaged, uh, generally they can, they are able to repair them uh, quite handily, but it just costs a lot more energy for them to do so, uh, just based on the kind of the changing uh, chemistry and environment of, uh, of the oceans and whatnot. So it is kind of like a really cool lens to sort of focus on. Um, there's also a lot of cultural history uh, with different things like the conch shells and things, uh, different islander, Pacific Islanders um, and Caribbean and stuff peoples, uh, kind of like what they've utilized shells for uh, over time, different festivals and stuff like that. So you definitely learn a lot of kind of like, the, like I said, the human connection with shells as well. And lots of really cool um, vignettes um, with uh, naturalists uh, who kind of focused on shells back in the 1800s and early 1900s, especially when seashell mania was kind of like a thing, especially kind of like um, kind of like the British naturalist, uh, amateur naturalist thing kind of going on where just collecting natural history objects was like really big. Um, you just kind of learn about that as well. So I just had a ton of fun with this book. Um, like I said, if you enjoy kind of reading about the oceans, if you enjoy collecting seashells, anything like that, definitely pick this one up for sure. Okay, so next up we have Sing Like Fish by Emerina Kingdon, and I was sent this by Crown, and I have a book review uh, for that as well, I'll leave it up there and down below, and this is all about the underwater soundscape, uh, you know, below the waters. There used to be kind of, um, kind of, I guess a, maybe myth is probably too strong a word, but there was kind of a conception that, you know, under the ocean waters and everything, it, everything, life and everything under there was just pretty quiet. Uh, you know, he had Jacques Cousteau's um, The Silent World. 
Uh, but that's totally false, basically. Um, we've, you know, after, you know, a couple decades more of research and different technologies and stuff, we found out, you know, just how prevalent sound is underwater, different, tons of different animals um, and ocean creatures just using sound for different reasons, whether that's, you know, uh, to kind of posture to threaten others, uh, to kind of, you know, do warning signs, communicate, all kinds of stuff, also interpret uh, like when to do things and stuff like that. So it's just really interesting. And it's not just about fish. Uh, uh, for some reason, I, I remember when I was like hyping this book up before I got it, I was like, for some reason, I thought it was like freshwater fish, but it's definitely all about like kind of like um, uh, marine fish in salt water and everything like that. Though I'm sure some of it actually would apply to freshwater like lake and river uh, fish as well. Uh, but you also learn about like noise pollution uh, under the water uh, with different kind of like shipping things windmills, uh, pile drivers uh, for like fracking and oil drilling and all that kind of stuff and kind of just all the different stressors that go on and how even just like uh, very small organisms like plankton and stuff, how they're kind of, they get like stressed out from these frequencies and kind of what kind of ripple effects those might have kind of like down the road and whatnot. But this was, like I said, this was just a really cool like niche uh, natural history like book, you know, when a journal, uh, and Amarina, what she does is she's like a journalist and goes on and kind of interviews with different scientists, goes on the boats with them and everything that kind of joins them a lot, tags along uh, during their research and whatnot. Just lots of fun. I love kind of like nature journalism, for, like in the sciences and stuff like that. And I highly recommended it. And like I said, if you want to check out the fuller review, I'll leave a link down below for that. Next up, we have War of the Whales, A True Story by Joshua Horowitz. And this is all about um, different beaching events that whales kind of undergone, or uh, undergone isn't probably the right word. Uh, I guess different beaching events that did occur uh, throughout like kind of the 90s, 2000s, things like that. Uh, you know, when for whatever reason, uh, whales would like, kind of land themselves on the seashore. And oftentimes, you know, that's fatal for the whale, even despite like, you know, our best efforts to intervene, like oftentimes it's just not enough or it's just not fast enough, you know, or there's just too much stress like on the whale uh, already. And there's not much that can be done. Um, but what this book uh, details is uh, some different kind of uh, people that were sort of investigating all these kind of uh, beached whale events and stuff. And eventually it was kind of uncovered that the United States Navy and in particular was doing a lot of, uh, I guess, underwater sound testing for different weapons, uh, acoustics sort of stuff kind of going on. And what people determined was this actually was like affecting, uh, you know, the marine wildlife quite heavily, most notably with the cetaceans. And the book also deals sort of with all the kind of legal, legal wrangling that's supposed to kind of go on to prevent this stuff uh, with like the EPA and everything, but how, uh, you know, due to it being kind of the, you know, the United States Navy, oftentimes a lot of their proposals were rubber stamped despite, you know, kind of the uh, unfortunate side effects that everyone kind of admitted would likely happen or they were glossed over or kind of hidden in everything. Uh, but also highlights a bunch of different uh, like a specialist, for example, one of the, the figures in this book was a, a former um, a Navy veteran who worked on like sonar and different underwater things. And he was a very uh, kind of crucial piece to putting a lot of this stuff together. Um, and it kind of just shows like a bunch of different uh, I guess, legal battles that uh, different environmental groups put forward uh, to kind of redress the situation and actually won a few of them against uh, the United States government and stuff like that. So uh, War of the Whales is actually somewhat <laughs> apt for a title and everything. And um, I just kind of, you know, if you're in the gloom and doom mood, this is a, like a good one to kind of exacerbate that problem for sure. <laughs> And then lastly is probably my favorite kind of ocean related author and it's Carl Safina and it's his very first book, Song for the Blue Ocean, Encounters Along the World's Coast and Beneath the Seas. Uh, this was just a fantastic book. I think I read, hmm, let's see, five, I think I have seven of his books. I think I've read five so far. I got to get his new one. Uh, was it Alfie Me? I think about an owl. But anyways, uh, Carl Safina is uh, a marine scientist, but he's also like negotiated uh, on a lot of sort of different like international fisheries laws and things like that and help develop different like hooks and actual you know bait and tackle and everything to help kind of prevent uh, uh, unwanted bycatch for example uh, turtles were uh, a very big one that he kind of worked on and he helped develop like a hook uh, that sort of would allow turtles to not be caught on these like long line uh, baited lines and everything 
Uh, but he also, like I said, he works like at, in, at the international level in different committees and stuff like that. And kind of proposes uh, and helps negotiate different uh, international, like kind of high seas fishery laws and everything, which can get pretty, uh, pretty chaotic, pretty uh, rough and tumble with some of the players, you know, who don't like some countries don't want to risk, you know, losing out on like income and like you know, there's obviously kind of like the political uh, grandstanding too with like fishery jobs and. Uh, the economy and stuff like that uh, and in this book uh, three different areas are highlighted uh, in particular uh, one is tuna fishing off the Atlantic coast uh, one is in the Pacific West with the salmon runs and then another the last chapter is about, like fishing in the, the Pacific Island Islander region um, but what's really cool is Carl Safina is an avid fisherman and he goes out on you know out on these uh, long fishing tours uh with with the men involved with this sort of thing and he doesn't want you know he's like on the ground on the boots on the ground with them you know he doesn't want people like lose their jobs and understands what it's like to actually be um you know a fisherman like kind of like in their shoes and stuff like that so that's why i really enjoy his stuff it's, it's just very down to earth um and it's not all just like ivory tower kind of uh, lording over like, you know, the regular working class people. So just thoroughly enjoyed Carl Safina's work. Um, pretty much every book I've read of his has been uh, amazing, at least like four and a half stars and stuff like that. So uh, like I said, definitely check out some of his other stuff. I think he's got, well, he does have, one, I don't know why I said I think he's got, he's got one on turtles, one on albatross, both of those were amazing. Um, as well as some more kind of like contemporary science books as well. But there you have it. Those are five books based on like kind of marine biology of the world's oceans and stuff. Let me know what you thought of any of those uh, down below if you've read any of them or their authors or anything like that. And let me know too as well if you have a topic based on like nature or the history and stuff that I read. If you want me to do kind of another video on kind of topics like this, let me know what you're thinking and I'll see what I can come up with. But whether you're reading books on marine biology or not, always remember, read victoriously.